LinkedIn News. From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday. A decade ago this summer, Tig Notaro walked on stage at a Los Angeles comedy club and began her set with one of the most memorable lines in comedy history. Hello, she said. Good evening, hello, I have cancer. A smattering of nervous teehees rippled through the audience. Tig's a comedian. Her job is to be funny, but that wasn't a very humorous moment in Tig's life. She'd just been diagnosed with cancer in both breasts. On top of that, she had survived pneumonia and C. diff just a few months earlier. She'd gone through a breakup, and her mom had died after a horrible accident. And in light of such a heavy moment in her life, Tig decided to talk about it. The resulting show changed the way we thought about comedy, and it changed the trajectory of Tig's career. In the decades since, Tig has worked prolifically. She's had her own show, One Mississippi. She's been on other TV shows. She has two podcasts and a new animated special, Tig Notaro, Drawn. She was here in New York for a conversation about her work for the Tribeca Film Festival. All that success had me curious to know if she would make the same decision today. To be frank and outspoken in her job about something so deeply personal. Here's Tig. Yes, I would I would definitely back that decision and do it again. You know, it's funny because with the pandemic, everybody always talks pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, and I'm very much similar around that time period where you're always getting to know yourself, but I, I really felt like I didn't know myself on a whole other level before 2012. So 2012 was, I think, what this past two-year period has been to, I think, far too many people. It wasn't simply one disaster. It was many on top of each other. Mm. And... um Comedians are, they're funny people. And we, I think, culturally mistakenly sometimes equate humor with lightness. Mm -hmm. What did humor mean to you before that turning point in your career? Well, I think I saw humor very much how people see it. The, The lightness, the silliness, and all of that is so incredible. And I'm a huge fan of silliness. And I would say even more so in 2012... I saw comedy in a very different way in that it helped me break through that time and connect with people. But I would say even with the pandemic, I'm learning on a whole other level where it's not just that it helped me through a time. One you were saying, I guess, before the show started that you came up and and explained what my show One Mississippi meant to you, I probably didn't fully take it in um, because I don't think I really got it or I got it, but I don't think I really did until the pandemic. And I, I started to understand how people really do use these TV shows or comedy albums or music to really get through it. And even though I knew I've done that before, right? I don't think I could really identify with being somebody that was that other people use to get through things. I may be overstepping with this, but it sounds like maybe part of what you're saying is that the pandemic sort of deepened or reframed how you thought about the work that you do. One million percent. And it's not that I take myself too seriously now where I'm like, wow, I really am a helpful savior. That's what I am. (laughs) But I do see the value more than I even did in 2012. And I also think there was a lot in 2012 that I couldn't see clearly for a while. It's Mm -hmm. been a process. When you made that decision in 2012, of course, you, you had no idea what the impact would be. Um, Or maybe you had, I don't know, I don't want to speak for you, but there were things that happened in the immediate aftermath, and then there are things that have happened since as a result of that. Mm -hmm. What didn't you know back then that you've learned? (laughs) I mean, so many things. I didn't know 
myself. I'm still learning about myself. I didn't know that I was capable of change, uh, commitment to myself, to others, to health, to my stand-up, my, my career, whatever form it takes. Like I was saying before, I, I just saw comedy and what I did as just a lighthearted, silly thing. And I learned that there is definitely power to entertaining or making somebody laugh or pulling them out of whatever moment they're in. Because through my own struggles, I am so thankful for what others have provided for me. Well, I think that there is power that comes from honesty, honesty with self, Mm -hmm. honesty with other people. Mm -hmm. And um, many people strive for honesty, but honesty, particularly self-honesty, is super challenging. Yeah. And I think for me, before I saw the work that you did then, I hadn't truly understood that humor could be a path to honesty rather Mm -hmm. than a path away from it. Mm -hmm. And that actually could clear the way for you to find ways not you particularly, but one, to find ways to be more honest with themselves about hard things. And I think that that, that to me was the magic of, of that period. Yeah, it's, it's, again, something I didn't think too much about. But you hear about the strength and power of honesty and, and what it can do to a person, to a moment, to growth. The feedback, general feedback that comedians are, and it, it's just people alive in the world, is your strength is to be yourself. And you hear that. You hear that being honest, hear that being vulnerable, you hear that being yourself is your superpower. And you can't quite wrap your head around that or apply it sometimes. And then you do. And it, sure enough, if you're, if you're really being very genuinely, authentically those things, it can be a superpower. Yeah. What does it mean to you that this moment that was the most difficult moment of your life? Well, it's the most well-known. Yeah. Difficult. Actually, I totally take that back. What am I saying? I don't know what the most difficult moment of your well, life is. Well, people always say that. They're like, <laughs> well, that was the hardest time of your life. And I always think, well. <laughs> you haven't been in my walk. I mean, I had a life before that and I've had a life after that, you know? Yeah. And, Completely. and and that's the thing is it's it's life. And um, I've struggled on both sides of that. How have you thought about navigating the decisions that you make around what roles you're going to take on, what projects that you're going to take on in the wake of that? I would say since that time period, I have been on a mission to feel good in my headspace, my body. The company that I keep, the decisions I make, all of it, I want to feel good. And that's not just me being selfish because I think it's kind of like with comedy. If I have to think it's funny for me to enjoy being there, which is going to hopefully in turn make the audience feel that way. So it's it's similar in that I want to feel good. It's an eclectic mix, Tig. Like, it's, it's your own shows. It's other people's really cool shows. Suddenly you're in Star Trek. You're like. Yeah. Then I'm in Army of the Dead, a zombie film. I can trace almost everything that I'm doing back to something positive or something that makes me feel good, whether it's who is involved in the project, what the project is saying. Am I going to have a good time? Sometimes I don't have a good time or it didn't feel good. And that's just. That's just life. Right. Uh, Wow, that project was rough or this person was brutal or this was not what I thought it was. But it it starts with I'm taking this because, well, that that sounds good. That, um, yeah, makes sense for the moment. How did the this sort of breakout moment you had a decade ago informed the types of choices that you had about what you could pursue after. I remember saying to my manager at the time, a couple of days after my story went viral, I I was saying, this is so odd. When do you think this is going to end? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I don't know, just this attention. I was making a good living and I was doing 
fine and happy with my career and I was moving along, but I wasn't used to having this huge flood of offers to do a book or a TV show, a movie, interviews and all sorts of things. I I was just like, when is this going to end? And and he was like, oh, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't see it ending. And I was just like, I thought it was going to end like the next day. Right. I'm lucky that I was at a place in my career, in my life, that I was seasoned. And so when I did get offers and opportunities, I was prepared because I had so much experience. Right. And I had a lot to share and say and and offer. I'm really curious about what that massive influx of attention felt like, whether you liked that or not. I certainly liked having opportunities to do things that I hadn't done before, but it was a confusing time because I was still struggling with my health in ways, um, and I was still very sad about losing my mother. I was also newly single and going through all of that by myself, and so it was it was a it was a confusing crossover of emotion and experience for me. So there were times where I was like, this is incredible. And there were other times where I was just like the stark reality of having stitches across my chest and no mother to call and no girlfriend to call. It wasn't just like, whoa, I went through that and now I'm on my (laughs) way to the top. It was like, oh, this is very hard. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, more with Tignataro. And we're back. Tig has had incredible career success, and that has gone hand in hand, like it does for a lot of us, with a very complicated personal life. It's one of the reasons I've been so eager to have Tig on the show. Instead of compartmentalizing her illness, her pain, her loss, like a lot of us do at work, Tig brings her whole self to her shows. She doesn't sugarcoat what she's going through. She steps through her life one day at a time and seems to trust that the people around her are capable of doing the same, even when those losses are major. I mean, you're catching me at a very odd point because I love my opportunities. I love the possibilities. Um, But I also, you know... You you said you enjoyed my show on Mississippi, and then very sadly, my stepfather from the show passed away recently, and that was unexpected. He died of C. diff, which is the oh. disease that I had 10 years ago, and then uh, I took him off life support 10 years to the day that I took my mother off life support. It oh. unbelievably lined up like that. Having... My career, my health, my family is incredible. And then when you're watching a a loved one die in in, in front of your eyes uh, again, is it puts this urgency, this sense of urgency. Like, what what am I doing? What do I? What do, what should I be doing? What? It's hard to walk out of a hospital again into the bright daylight with people parking their car and pushing the buttons on the elevator. What floor are you going to after you just watched your loved one die slowly? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where I am. It's still relatively new. And so I'm 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 still a little like I'm I'm at a crossroad where I'm I'm a little like what what am I doing? What am I gonna do? What should I do? How am I feeling? Where am I going? Right. What what feels right, you know? Um, but I'm also, again, newly moving furniture out of my stepfather's house, and and just I'm just in that place. Uh, that is, it's like a a tenuous, prolonged pause. I, I'm sorry for that. I appreciate it. I'm sorry for it too. Like I can't believe it. But that's where I am, and it has leveled me in a different way then, you know, you can be sick at different points in your life, but there's different sick. Yeah. And I'm leveled 
but it's a different level. It's yeah. it's it's different. It's there. It's always different. Yeah. Um, at one point when I lost my stepfather, I remember thinking that you should wear something like right here yeah. that people would just recognize as a yeah. symbol, so they just talk to you differently for a while. Somebody was just saying that how you should have a band around your arm so people just know I've I'm going through trauma right now. I'm 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 struggling a bit. And uh, I think it's a really good idea. <laughs> I think something, something, something. I do, because how can anybody ask anything as prosaic as do you want sugar in your latte right. in this moment? Or at least that, to me, was how I experienced it. And, well, I'm sorry for um, your loss. Well, it happened a decade ago, and I can invoke it like that, because mm-hmm. those great losses in our lives, yeah. they're, they're always, they like, they ride. They yeah. ride right under the surface, right? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So so it is an odd moment, and I so appreciate you sharing that also because it's a moment that too many people have experienced in ways that they didn't expect to in our, in our culture in mm-hmm. the last couple of years. Loss mm-hmm. is riding much closer to the surface than it ever has been before. Mm-hmm. And it can be challenging to figure out how... how What we do even matters, right, in the context of that. But it also does bring us back to a sense of, like, purpose around, Mm -hmm. like, how we think about what we do. You use the word urgency. I so appreciate that word. Oh, my gosh. So, I mean, urgency. That is what I'm feeling right now. And do you do you, do you operate? Are you a person who operates in the world with the sense that you have a purpose? Or is that not how you think about it? I think my purpose and everybody's purpose is to try to be happy on some level. And so I think that that is the purpose to living and having relationships and whatever it is, friends, family, work. It kind of goes back to what I was saying before, where I, I have to be happy in order to be able to make others happy. So I think that feels like my purpose. And so I feel happy. I feel certainly I'm not walking around um, crying and you know what I mean? Like I'm here in town with my wife and children, my mother-in-law. We are sitting at breakfast. We're laughing. We're having a good time. The kids are misbehaving. They're doing a good job traveling. It's all happening. All the good, all the bad's happening. Sure. And I'm having good moments but i'm um i'm very much trying to refocus and go okay back to the urgency what do i want to do what how do i want to spend my time and um yeah what is yeah. my purpose my purpose is to be happy how do i maintain that happiness which is also something i think is key is rather than And everybody falls for it, but wanting more and more and more is how do you maintain what you you have? And that's, I think, is really key, too, because you learn more, more, more doesn't always work, whatever it is. Right. To do that, you need to understand what you have. A good friend of mine, several years ago, I had a deep personal loss. I lost somebody very close to me, and she said, oh, yeah, you know, I was at that point was in my early 40s. And she said, nobody tells you this, but your whole first half of your life is about figuring out how to experience love, Mm -hmm. just how to experience it. And you finally kind of get it. And then you enter the second half of your life, which is a gut punch because it's all about figuring out how to love through loss. Yeah. And here we are. Yeah. Second half. Yeah. Tig and I touched on so many topics in our conversation. And before we wrapped up, there was one more thing I just really wanted to know, if you'll indulge me. She has a special, maybe you've seen it on Netflix. It's called Happy to Be Here. Now, for ages around the time she made this special, when Tig was out touring on the road, she'd get to the end of the set and she'd say, and now, the Indigo Girls. And that was it. There was no curtain call. There were no Indigo Girls to be found. But now if you watch the special on Netflix, there's a joke. It's at the end of her set. She plays drums. She says, here they come. And you wait, and they don't come. And then she says, they're coming, and you wait, and they don't come. And just at that moment where you're like, oh, I guess it's like that thing she does, out walk the Indigo Girls. And I just needed to understand how that was even possible. 
Like, is there some super cool queer lady club with a bat signal that I don't know about? Yeah, I'm. I mean, I've gotten some bat phone numbers of people in the the bat club, but I I had been doing that joke for a long time, like maybe a year or so, mm-hmm. and uh, I was ending every performance with that and teasing that the Indigo Girls were going to be there, and they never were. And um, I just thought, well, it's really fun to do it when they're not and to just end the joke with, if you want to see the Indigo Girls, then buy tickets to the Indigo Girls and just end it there. But, yeah, I reached out. We have mutual friends. And so I reached out and I was hoping to workshop this show with them. Uh, when I was headlining Carnegie Hall. Mm. And so they planned their tour. They were totally into it. They told me when we were in person, they said, we kind of couldn't, we just trusted you. We weren't quite sure what you were saying. Uh, <laughs> and and I was like, I know, it's completely bizarre. But um, so they routed their tour to finish in New York at Carnegie Hall. And so they came and did it at Carnegie Hall. And then um, after that, I said, okay, I'm taping my special. Will you come do it? And they did. And then when I was doing a warm-up run of shows leading up to the taping, I was thinking, well, this will be really fun and exciting, but some people might not know or care about the Indigo Girls, and they're there to see me perform. So it's kind of weird that I just introduced them as though – you know what I mean? Yeah, and so okay. I just thought I should probably be on stage too. Yeah. I was wondering how you thought about that. Yeah. So that's what it was. And I play a little bit of drums. And so I. Did you play drums beforehand? Was my question. Only on the dashboard of the car. I, you... I had played drums mm-hmm. over the years, but right. I hadn't really in right. a few years. But right. I was practicing on the dashboard of the car just to kind of get ready. Because uh, they agreed to have me on stage with them. I love that. It's great to have you in the studio. Thanks for so having that. me. We were high. We were low. I really enjoyed the conversation. I appreciate it. Well, I really uh, appreciate you having me. Cool. And maybe I'll see you in Mississippi. That was Tig Notaro. Her new special, Drawn, is out now on HBO. And her new film, Am I OK?, co-directed with her wife, Stephanie Allen is out later this year. This week on Hello Monday Office Hours, we're going to talk about bringing our whole selves to work. How do we do that during periods of illness and loss? Lord knows we've had a lot of that over the last couple years. Join us on the LinkedIn news page at 3 p.m. Eastern this Wednesday. We'll work it out. And as always, if you like the show, please follow and review us wherever you get your shows. It really helps us. Thank you. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. Our producer is Sarah Storm. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Iriando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is head of news production. Michaela Greer and Victoria Taylor think we're funny. Sometimes. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. See you next Monday. Thanks for listening. You know, in this role, I get to interview Often, people like you, I don't feel like I'm too starstruck. But um, a few years ago, I was coming home from a business trip in LaGuardia, and I saw you in the airport. It was around the one Mississippi time. Oh. And I, like, just ran for you to talk to you. <laughs> and my wife was like, don't do that. Don't do that. And then immediately, like, pretended that we weren't together. She just, like, totally. That's hilarious. And I ran up to you, and I was like, you know, it's me. And I wanted to tell you, like, I'm the other lesbian in Mississippi. Like, <laughs> That's right? funny. And, uh,